Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition. It is March 18th of 1942, and we are playing the most recent turn in the game. XTRG just sent it on over, and I am looking at it for the first time here live with all of you tonight. Uh, I am going to be keeping a close eye on what happens at Singapore today. He attacked Singapore last turn and he reduced the fortifications from three to two, uh, which I think probably means if he really wants to keep up the assaults, he could reduce the the base to, to surrender in two to three days. Uh, but he might not. He might think that's a little bit over aggressive. He might have fatigue or morale levels that he's not willing to test. Uh, meanwhile, we've got a cargo ship here off the coast of the United States that's getting attacked by Japanese submarines. Probably doesn't have adequate uh, escort here. He's using a lot of torpedoes on it, though. He fired a first salvo. It didn't hit anything. The second salvo put two, uh, put a torpedo into the side of the Admiral Williams. I think it was just carrying fuel or, or supplies, uh, so it shouldn't really be that much of a loss. We've got a ton of those things. Meanwhile, another Japanese surface bombardment task force appears to be making its way into Port Moresby. Uh, and um, and is going to be doing some damage potentially here. We'll see. It looks like mostly cruisers. Uh, we have our own uh, naval, or we have our own soldiers, obviously, ashore. They don't have a ton of supply, but we're ferrying in new supply uh, every turn via air transport to try and keep them fighting effectively. So hopefully, even if we do lose a little bit of supply, there's not much there to be lost in the first place. So we'll go ahead and fast forward that. You can see here another 192 allied casualties. One infantry squad destroyed the rest are non-combatants. One engineer as well. He also put one shell into the airbase, 14 under the runway, which is actually good because we've been repairing the runway, and I would rather when he takes the base for the runway to be in really bad shape. Uh, and then we've got two port hits as well. Like a G-Men, thank you for the bits. Appreciate it. So that wasn't too devastating of a bombardment. It doesn't look like he probably did all that much damage. Meanwhile, it looks like he's got some uh, destroyer transports, APDs, uh, bombarding. Oh, he's landing reinforcements at Kuching. That's good for us. It's diverting more Japanese forces away from other potential advances. So Kuching, he has not been able to take with the forces he's deployed there. So he is bringing reinforcements there to finally lock that down. Meanwhile, he's moving some troops down toward the tip of... Uh, the base on New Britain. Uh, is that New Britain? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, at Gassama or Gatsamia. I couldn't really see the word before it disappeared. Um, at the tip of uh, of the island Rabal's on. Um, yeah. So a couple of landings, a couple of bombardments in the AM phases, and we'll move to uh, to the air operation phase. Jack Tank Singapore held last turn. I don't know if he attacks again this turn, if it holds. I assume it still has level 2 forts, so I would think that uh, it was Cape Gloucester. Okay. Um, but I would think that it will hold at least one more attack, maybe two. Um, so that could be anywhere between two to three days if he's aggressive, or it could be five or six days if he's cautious with his troops. Um, and their and their fatigue levels. Meanwhile, it looks like he's diverted some G3M2 Nels into land bombing raids, which he has been very reluctant to do since he's lost he lost heavy bomber casualties over the Philippines. And ever since then, he's been really reluctant to use his G3Ms and his G4Ms on any sort of strategic bombing raids here. But uh, it does look like he is he's maybe. Curing himself of that hesitancy, you can see the runway took 26 hits. Miraculously accurate bombing, by the way, um, to have 28 air hits on the target with only 27 bombers and, what, just over 100 bombs, about 150 bombs? I guess we don't know if they're 60 kilograms or if they're, uh, if they're 250s. All right, some further raids here with army bombers, some KI-21 Sallies, and some KI-30 Ands, as well as some pretty heavy escorts of Oscars and uh, Kates and, or sorry, Nates and Tojos. You can see there, 14 aircraft damage by Flak, another uh, 11 hits here. These guys were far less accurate with their bombs, although much heavier bomb loads of only 250 kilogram bombs uh, on the target. Yeah, he's got Nels at Palembang already, so that's... That definitely influences our ability to run supplies. It means we've got to keep things much more cautiously further west of the Dutch East Indies to make sure that bombers out of Palembang don't uh, 
don't interdict our supply convoys there. Meanwhile, a bunch of enemy shipping off the coast of Borneo. Perhaps he's getting ready for his invasion of Java. Uh, that would definitely be possible. We'll have to take a look. Stepping up some recon there in the Burma Theater as well. Uh, some pretty heavy recon over Pegu. And another raid over uh, Singapore here. Bombing over Singapore. Du -du 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 -du. Uh, I don't think he'll do too much damage to the to the airfield at Singapore, P. Warner. I think the reality is it's like a level 6 or level 7 airfield, so it can take quite a bit of punishment. And the Japanese bombers aren't like the U.S. 4-engine heavies and as, as easy to, uh, to shut down airfields. Do we have an idea of a counterpunch or what we will do? Um rough idea. I think we're still really focused on absorbing the punch. I have some units preparing for New Caledonia or other things like that, but I think we're realistically four or five more months away from a serious counter punch. We may look for, and I, I have some ideas, and, and maybe one of them is already in progress. Uh, I, have an I have some ideas on how we could counterpunch in a very limited way just to basically either force him to react where he thinks maybe there's an opportunity to rack up some victory points or, or just sort of divert his attention away from his strategic advance by forcing him to sort of mop up potentially some isolated... Uh, isolated bases. Uh, looks like he's only going to bombard at Singapore here today, so that's good for us. Uh, means he's going to be focusing on wearing our troops down with artillery, which might make his follow-on attacks more successful, but I am hopeful that uh, that we survive one more mainline attack there. You can see he only lost one vehicle in counter-artillery fire. We lost 109 infantry, two infantry squads, six disabled, but there was no serious attack there, so my hope is that we'll survive at least one more attack, which means two more days uh, before Singapore falls, uh, depending on when he attacks again. He may he may go back over to the bombardment focus uh, for a couple of days, which would be greatly appreciated. Meanwhile, Japanese deliberate attack here to the east of Quilin. You can see he's got like four divisions here, so our troops are retreating toward Quilin. He did drive us out of the base there. Three to one advantage there. We lost 245 squads. Uh, that's bad. That's real bad. He, uh, he, pretty, he pretty savagely beat up um, two cores there. Um, pretty big victory for him to the east of Quilin. I wasn't happy that my troops were just kind of like hanging out there and allowing themselves to get ground down. I really wanted them to, uh, to retreat last turn. But if their assault value was only 182 before that attack, I can't imagine they have much of anything left now. We'll have to take a look at that. We do have a, a cavalry corps that's waiting in the, in the adjacent hex. But that by itself is just going to repeat the, the the experience of the troops that were just attacked. So, um, you know, I've got additional reinforcements on the way, but I was really hoping to hold out to the east of the city of Quilin, not to the uh, not in the city of Quilin. It looks like we might have to hold out in Quilin itself, which has times two defense, not times three, which is an ideal. It does have th level three forts though. Um, okay, so Japanese deliberate attack at Kaigun here on the southern portion of Mindanao. Another failure there. So our troops there, despite having almost no supply, uh, are holding out, probably because pretty good train. They also have level 2 forts. You can see the Japanese assaulted with 407 assault value, 12,985 troops. The defenders had 9,887 troops, 76 guns, 53 vehicles. Uh, they were outnumbered just shy of 2 to 1 in terms of assault value, but when you adjust for the forts and the terrain, it was actually a 1 to 2 advantage for the Allies. Despite supply being an issue and experience and morale being an issue, we do have good leaders and terrain there, so those are big perks. That meant 1,541 Japanese casualties, 22 squads destroyed, quite a few there, 185 disabled. That is a bloody repulse for the Japanese. We did lose 13 squads destroyed and 40 disabled that we won't be able to get back, but a 3-to-1 advantage to us in terms of numbers, far more than 3-to-1 in terms of, uh, actually closer to 4-to-1 in terms of units either destroyed or disabled. So uh, Kaigun was, uh, was a good result for us there uh, against the Japanese or uh, Kagayan uh, on the uh, tip of Mindanao. So another good result there. Japanese shock attack to the south of Palembang. I couldn't get those troops from Palembang out. I was hoping to move them further west toward uh, Belokin, um, but it looks like they retreated there anyway. Uh, they lost uh, pretty heavily, I would imagine. We lost one unit destroyed, two retreating, 1,200 Dutch casualties, 40 squads destroyed, 94 non-combatants destroyed. 
uh, and some guns. Those guys are not going to recover by the time they get to the west coast of, uh, of Palembang. The road is now clear, by the way, to the south to Oosthaven, where another 100,000 Japanese oil awaits, uh, or, or soon-to-be Japanese oil awaits, uh, currently sitting in the storage tanks there. Meanwhile, Japanese shock attack at Rabaul against uh, our Lark Battalion. Interestingly enough, we actually, despite having no supply, uh, we inflicted 70 casualties on them and disabled a couple Japanese squads. They didn't destroy us, but they did disable a bunch of our squads. So hopefully that burns a little bit of supply uh, as the Lark Battalion gets chewed down to nothing. Buka, meanwhile, the 84th Guard uh, unit landed there. They took that base. Japanese are also attacking at Milne Bay, which is more than they historically did. So that's another victory there. That base was unoccupied. Direct attack on Torokina, which is on the island of, uh, of is that Bougainville? Bougainville? Um, near Shortlands. Uh, so victory there. Treasury Island. All these bases are unoccupied. So yes, the Japanese are taking a bunch of islands with a bunch of different elements of Naval Guard units. Looks like they're all fractions of the 84th Naval Guard, by the way. Uh, but you can see here they're solidifying their position in the Solomon Sea. Okay, so we're expanding some fortifications. Keep your heads down! Alright, so uh, we expanded fortifications in a couple of different bases. Um, and now it's doing the calculating spoilage and supply and aircraft repair and all that jazz here. Yeah, a lot of bonsais, AZ. Uh, but uh, good news for us is that most of those bases were unoccupied. The one major uh, defeat for us was to the east of Quilin, where they really ravaged two Chinese corps there. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to stop them before they get to Quilin, um, which is unfortunate because the terrain to the east of the city is ideal for making a stand. Um, but we'll have to take a look. I know you posted some plans in the in the uh, Discord, but I'm I'm not recalling exactly what plan J was. All right, so they're pull, pulling back to Dumjabi. The Japanese may be slowly pursuing them with one unit there. Meanwhile, it looks like the Japanese are moving units south, so they're going to try and go down that roadway to Oosthaven, where there's a hundred thousand oil uh, sitting there waiting for them. It does look like they're going to have a clear road to the south to Oosthaven. It'll also give them a level 2 airfield just adjacent to uh, Java, which may allow them to hit a little bit more effectively at the base there. Uh, the troops that retreated, we'll try and get some of them out. I don't even know if there's any really infantry units left. Yeah, all the all the soldiers are gone. They're all dead or captured. So Benelukin will fall as well without much preamble. Meanwhile, the supplies in Singapore are down to 10,000, which is great for us because the less supply for us here, the less for him when he captures the base. We're trying to rebuild the fortifications. We did make a little bit of progress. We're up to 18%. Uh, the defenders have about 550 assault value left, so they could even fall technically on, on the next attack here, but I'm hoping they don't. Uh, we really just have two good units left, the 11th Indian Division and the 9th Indian Division. That's about it. I was trying to pull out elements of the SSV Brigade, uh, because at the time of last turn, they were all completely, um, uh, what do you call it? They were all suppressed, so they all had like this parentheses thing here where the infantry wasn't adding adding value. Um, it does look like we got 10 squads out to Meden, which is actually quite a few, 10 Malayan squads out to Meden. Um, we also got a few out to uh, Sabang, uh, I think, yeah. We also got two out to Sabang. So we pulled 12 squads out there. We'll probably pull another 12 out tomorrow. And then maybe we can get them out of there. Meanwhile, Sabang could be a nice little uh, defensive post. I should really be pulling the fuel and oil and supplies north from Meden, which are generated there, because it is an oil generating base as well as generates supplies. I should really be trying to pull some of these north into the base. So maybe we'll just do that. We'll, we'll request as much as we can at Sabang to pull it away. We do have a reasonably strong defensive position there. We're working on the engineering. The fortifications aren't very strong. Um, but the base itself, uh, it's clear terrain. That's not good. Um, but whatever. Um, meanwhile, we are pulling some motor launches out towards Sabang. They were coming out of Singapore. So there's that. All of our other shipping is out of Singapore. We also do have a light transport, the Felix Rosal which apparently got all the way to Sabang and then has decided to turn around. It was supposed to stay at Sabang, I guess. 
<sighs> so it could have been loading troops this turn undetected from from the Japanese because there was no recon over it last turn. Instead, somehow it decided to turn around instead of docking its a bang and and getting out of there in one turn, so we'll have to see. Meanwhile, other troops of the 223 RAF group, which we had already pulled out of Sabang via transport on further French transports are on their way to um, on their way to Rangoon. They're making pretty good progress. They should be there in a couple of days. Um, doesn't look like he does have some recon that's occurring near Rangoon still. So you can see he's got recon detection on some of these some of these convoys, not all of them, uh, but at least this one over here and this one over here just about to enter the port at Rangoon. Uh, meanwhile, uh, additional transports have finished unloading at Rangoon. We've got further transports presently unloading. We'll go ahead and dock them. They're 46,000 tons. That should get these guys unloaded probably in two days, which is just in time because we've got another 29,000 supply coming in. These guys from Cape Town uh, should be arriving tomorrow uh, with additional supplies. So we've got 37,000 in the port, 29,000 more coming. So that's about another 60,000 uh, can I do math? Yeah, about another 65,000. That'll be at Rangoon. Rangoon's supply situation is 81,000. Pegu's at 20,000. There's a little bit of spoilage occurring here, so I am working on building the airfield. That's going to take a little bit of time. Um, additionally, I have decided to move some of my troops south from Pegu to the base south here, uh, just south of Pegu. The re and I say, I can. how many times can I say south of Pegu? The reason is there's Pegu is actually clear terrain, which is very vulnerable to enemy attacks. We would be better off making a stand south here, just north of Molmun. Uh, the enemy crossing the river will have to make a shock attack. The enemy can't easily flank our position with any roadways, although they could come through Chiang Ma, so we'll still leave some troops behind at Pegu. Um, and additionally, it's wooded terrain, which gives us better defensive terrain. Troops can still build fortifications in this kind of terrain, um, so they just need to kind of sit there for a while in combat formation. So we're going to switch the 46th Brigade over to combat formation. Additionally, in order to fight the impact of jungle terrain. I reworked some of the commanders here. Um, so if we take a look here at the 1st Burma Division, uh, I got a new commander in Demoline William Alfred. Uh, I'm not sure if that's Demoline William Alfred. He's a Brigadier General. He has 61 leadership and 56 inspiration. But the real reason I put him in charge, in addition to his 60 land combat, which isn't actually the best, is his 57 admin skill is pretty damn good. The the guys above him, there were a couple of options that had better admin skills, but their land combat was noticeably worse. Uh, and their in some cases, their uh, their leadership was way worse in the case of West, uh, or their just you know the fact that Ellis has uh, basically almost identical leadership and inspiration. His land combat trait is so much worse. So I, I reason that Dimoline Alfred is the best balancing act. Admin skills will lower how much fatigue or how much uh, impact being in a malaria zone will have on your soldiers. Uh, and so that's why I'm moving those guys a little bit further south. Um, meanwhile, in terms of the supply situation in China, I'm going to go into this a little bit later in the stream. So guys, I'm going to do sort of my overview in the stream. But then I also have something I want to show you guys outside of the game. That's from a War in the Pacific tracker that'll give us a summary of the supply situation in India, Burma, and China, which I think is pretty interesting to look at. Meanwhile, you can see here to the east of Quilin, the Japanese drove our troops back. They drove them back one hex. Uh, the 6th Chinese Corps is 58 assault value left. The 14th Chinese Corps is completely wrecked with only 13 assault value left. I'm going to just try and get these guys out of here. Just pull these guys out as quick as they can um, because they they need to rest. I need to save those squads, those disabled squads, and I want to get them out of there. Uh, meanwhile, in terms of troops coming to the aid of those, those, those boys, uh, we've got the 66th Chinese Corps, which is almost arriving. It's got 20 more miles to, to march, so it might actually arrive tomorrow. Uh, which can then hopefully give give some aid to the troops that are already here. We're, we don't have any fort levels, and so I'd be open to any thoughts or recommendations that any of you guys have. I'm not sure if you know how fort levels work, but again, those off-map forts, I'm wondering if being an off-map level WR, which is a level 3 defensive terrain, is better, or if we should just con concede the fact that we're going to have to fight in Quilin and fall back to Quilin, where we've got level 3 forts, but only a times 2 defensive terrain hex. So level three forts with two defensive terrain or level three defensive terrain with no forts because he's going to get there before we build any forts. Uh, additionally, the 77th, 99th, and 53rd cores have all progressed um, a little bit further. They're just at 38 miles, so they should be in the next hex 
uh, tomorrow, which will put them one away from Quilin. So there's that. Um, like a G-Man, do you actually know how the forts work, though? Or are you just saying pull back because that you think it's the best option? Um, all right. Meanwhile, at... Uh, where is this base again? Ch Chikikang. We're working on getting the level 5 forts. We're at 45%. We have been steadily pulling some of these troops out. Uh, but we still have quite a few troops here at 4,500 assault value. We also have these troops to the east of that base that are in uh, good defensive terrain, and they also have good fort levels. The interesting thing about fort levels, and I didn't know this when I started the game. I only really recently figured this out. Fort levels that you earn when you are in an off-map hex cannot be reduced by enemy engineers. So you're way better off fighting off-map unless you can get the fort levels in a base up really, really high which you can't, I don't believe, get them as high in non-base hexes. Also, if you build the base forts up, then every unit that pulls into the base gets those fort levels instantly, uh, as opposed to when they're in non-base hexes, the units have to build them individually. So you can see here some units have two, some units have one, but the engineers can't reduce these fort levels, which makes the off-map uh, fort levels uh, or off-base fort levels a little bit more um, robust. Okay, so we'll consider pulling back to Quilin then, if we can. I mean, he might be able to beat us there anyway. But we've already got the 400 troops here, the 400 assault value there, so that would be good uh, to build our defense around. That 400 plus the the 1,000 coming down the road, I think should be able to be enough to allow us to, to tie him up at Quilin. Uh, meanwhile, in the north of China, that's probably where the bigger risk is. Cyan is much weaker. He's going to need to bring in heavy heavy reinforcements to take Cyan. The one risk is that he could probably flank Cyan somewhat easily if he moves up this roadway here. It'll be slow along these minor roads, but he could do it. Um, we do have some troops on the opposite side of this river, which have some decent fortifications themselves, but they're not very strong. Uh, the terrain is rough, though, so that gives us a nice little bonus. Uh, another option is for him to just move unopposed to the west along this rail line toward Cyan. Uh, I'm going to move some additional reinforcements from Cyan into this rough terrain here, or maybe even this WR terrain here further east. Uh, I've got to balance where the right right spot is to make a make a stand. But I also want to have a few troops over here in this clear terrain so they can they can kind of threaten his rear if he tries to advance west along this railway. So he currently has two brigades here. That's not really a threat with the troops I have in place. Uh, we've got like 1,300 assault value, and the terrain is beneficial for the defense. I don't know how many units. He has four units here. I don't know how many of those are divisions. Still, even if they were all divisions, he needed like 1,600 assault. We've got 2,100 assault value in this base, and we've got some pretty dug-in troops as well, level two forts plus the modifiers. So that would be good for us. But he could certainly bring an overwhelming amount of troops into this base and then go directly at Cyan. I think the bigger risk is that he launches some sort of big flanking maneuver out toward Pao Tao or toward Yan'an. Neither of those could I really do anything about if he did launch those types of assaults. So we have to be very mindful of that as well. So far, nothing developing that we can see that would be a serious threat there. Uh, but he's got the interior lines and he's got the railways uh, to to be able to execute something like that pretty effectively. I do have a few bases that are open in my rear. I've got a base up north here at Kuching. Uh, I've also got a base at uh, Ankang. I have troops on the way to both of those, and I have Cap flying over some of those bases to hopefully minimize the likelihood that he uh, that he launches some kind of long-range paratrooper strike in our rear, uh, but I am trying to remedy that at the moment. I am also moving troops toward another base over here near Suyong uh, that is also unoccupied to make sure that he can't drop troops there. Uh, and I also am moving elements of the 5th Chinese Corps toward the Burma front as well. Um, not this unit. So, not this unit. Or is it this unit? Yeah, elements of the 5th. So the 5th Chinese Corps is here, which has quite a bit of assault value right now on map. They also have the ability to build out into a huge formation with like th like thousands of assault values, my understanding, if they equip all their troops fully. Um, and historically, they were used in Mandalay as well. Uh, so a lot of these these units are already, and not this one, I'll have to, I'll have to tweak that. But some of these units are already uh, set to the, the proper, um, well, what is it? Well, they're already planning for a Mandalay, but I guess I need to figure out their headquarters situation because they're all currently still set on restricted. Um, got a couple of lightnings. 
my fighters here. The fatigue situation is getting a little bit, a little bit bad in the patrol aircraft. A few of the fighter fatigue levels are starting to pop up as well. Nothing too worrisome yet. Uh, I gave the the aircraft at Pegu the day off, so you can see their fatigue got got down to more manageable levels. Um, I'm curious about the the experience levels on a lot of these aircraft is pretty good as well. I'm not sure if we're we're gaining experience as we're flying cap. It does look like we're gaining some experience for some of these pilots as we're flying cap. When you see green, it means they went up last turn. Actually, the P40 Warhawk of the the of P40 Warhawks of the 17th Pursuit Group, quite a lot of experience gained the last few turns, 56, 55, 54, 52, um, you know, a lot of green there, so that's good to see, um, as well as the P39 pilots, so definitely getting ready for the eventual uh, war against the uh, the Japanese here as as they eventually threaten, uh, threaten uh, Rangoon. Um, all right, so we looked at Singapore, we looked at China, we looked at uh, Burma, the situation in Bataan is really unchanged. 15,000 supplies still for the troops there. Uh, we're sitting on um, just shy 2,000 assault value. Uh, and, and if he doesn't attack, that supply could last a while. Once he starts aggressively attacking there, that supply might dwindle. But I'm still hopeful that we get into mid-April. He, he needs to reinforce here. He only has, from last intelligence, two divisions against us in Bataan. We could probably, if we launched a really strong attack, have a chance of pushing him back with our current force, but it would spend so much of our assault value and so much of our supply, and we'd get very little back that it wouldn't really be worth it. Um, in terms of troops currently in Mandalay, Mandalay has a couple of base force units, an armored brigade, uh, and, uh, and whatnot. So this base force unit just moved here, I think, because we're trying to get the aviation support up because we have some aircraft that we're trying to get ready. Um, the 20, 254th Armored Brigade. You know, one other thing I need to make sure I do is I garrison the rear areas in, in Burma as well so that he can't just drop, like, troops down on Maguay uh, and, uh, and take that base. I'm trying to see where we have... The one good thing is for us, he doesn't have a ton of paratroopers, and he did drop some of them over on Port Blair. So they're just still kind of hanging out. These guys are moving to Pegu. You know, honestly, it's probably better just to move them for the time being until I can get more troops into Maguay up to there, because he could, he could range it from Chiang Ma easily, maybe even from Molmun. Eight. I'm not sure he can hit there from Bangkok. 15, that's a little bit longer, but I want to make sure that we're not we're not getting um, surprised. The anti-aircraft unit at, uh, at Mandalay, I'll consider moving to Rangoon, but I do think that there is value in, in holding it at Mandalay as well. We do have some aircraft at Mandalay. We don't want to get bombed. Um, so that's, that's something to be careful with. Hey, Lady Candace, good to see you there. Base forces have AA, yes, I know, like a G-Men, but we also have a bunch of base forces at Rangoon, too. So, um, or at least we have a couple of base forces at Rangoon, I believe. Or maybe, no, maybe just one. Huh. But we do have two AA units at Rangoon already. Not heavy AA, though, like the guys at Mandalay. Well, these aren't even, they're auxiliary. They're not heavy. Bofors and 3.7 inch. The 3.7 inches can probably reach up a ways. Okay, so let's see what we want to take a look at here. One second. Okay. Newhouser, I don't, I don't know what you mean by your, uh, your, your note. Um, all right, so let's see. So the troops at Man or at uh, Kaigan withstood a strong enemy attack there. You can still, still see they have a fair amount of uh, AV on the 102nd Filipino Ar Ar Army Infantry Division, which was the, is the main defender there. 
So they're still hanging out there. The Japanese, I don't think they're going to launch an attack again. Uh, and we're continuing to tie down pretty considerable uh, defensive uh, units there. So that's, uh, or at least units that could be used for offensive actions. So that's good. Also, apparently we have PT boats operating at, out of Cebu. Not sure that I want that. So we'll pull them back to Surabaya. If we can even get there. Where can we refuel along the way? All the bases are taken. Uh, nowhere? Is that the answer? Um, crap. Well, they're goners. There's nowhere to refuel. Oh, we can refuel at Sandakan. I don't know that that'll give us enough fuel to get there, but... All right, um, so we'll refuel the P2 boats at Sandman, and then we'll have them swing down towards Sorbet, hopefully. Meanwhile, I'm wondering if the invasion force of Java is here. Uh, we've spotted an enemy troop transport moving west, uh, a cruiser moving west, and a patrol gunboat moving west. We know that Semeriang was where he was planning on landing, uh, based off of intelligence that we gained. We don't really have much in the way of air units that can try and counter him. We also have a bunch of APs and APDs here, and then we've also got some other troops uh, or other ships here. So I think we're going to see a landing at Semeriang in the next couple of turns. I'm not sure what to do. Um, we are, I think we did try and get some PT boats further south here. How much, why are these guys trying to go back there? What, no, God damn it. Um, so they got to Batavia, but they lost all their fuel on the way, and so they're very ba in very bad shape. Probably too bad a shape to attack anything. 20 system damage is going to basically make any attack here worthless. We can repair some of these guys potentially in two days, but my guess is the landings will occur before then. Those guys are going to take longer, so I'll just set them to normal. I don't want to disrupt the other unit. So if we look at the shipping being repaired, 6 and 2. How quick can these guys repair? Can they both be back in 2? Yeah, okay, that's good. Let's see if the other guys are still at two. I just, every time you change a priority, it changes the other guy. So these switch to three, two, two. So let's see what the situation is now. Two ships at three, two at two, one at seven. So they're not going to be ready to launch, uh, to be, to be in the way Shit. These motor torpedo boats are trying to make it there, but they ran out of fuel along the way, and so they're going to take a bus bunch of systems damage. They may they may get in the way of the enemy shipping, um, <laughs> theoretically. I don't have any way to lay mines. Uh, we don't have any available mines there. I do have submarines that are sort of trying to pre-position themselves in the way. So we've got these subs that are, where's, all right, that's the, those are p patrol boats. But we have several submarines that are forming screens. Where are these guys going? So I think what we'll do is we'll set a patrol zone for some of these guys, um, hopefully to intercept these guys a little bit further out. The problem is this is all shallow water, so anti-submarine uh, attack, anti-submarine um work is going to be very effective in this region. Why are these all guys all going to Java? I don't think I told them to do that. They still have torpedoes. Try and intercept them. I'm not sure they'll get there this turn or not. If they go this turn, they'll probably arrive in the daylight. My guess is he may hold them off for one more turn before he, he tries to land. We do have some other, other subs here that are trying to screen this area. We didn't get any attacks in the area. I'm going to pull the trusty back. We've got interior lines here, so we can we can swing that way, I think. 
set new patrol zones further west. I'm sure they're not making 15 knots. These guys might intercept this turn. And these guys might intercept this turn. So we'll leave the swordfish and the KXV6, or the K16, um, in their current patrol orders. And then we'll have other, other subs move north. We also have further... Uh, these guys are damaged, aren't they? In theory. Not too badly, but... Pulling back here. Japan is the harder side, but I am uh, heaven. I'm playing against a human, so that's why. So I'm playing. This is a play by email game that's being uh, run in uh, daily turns. The game is one turn per day, so everything you see here being done against me is being done by another human. I'm playing against another YouTuber named XTRG. All right, so we're trying to pull. I'm wondering if so. If we know he's going to land at Semarang. The question that we have is we're not going to meet him on the beach there. It's a level, it's a clear terrain hex, so we'll just get blasted off the beaches. There's no reason he wouldn't bombard either because there's um, there's no oil facilities here that he'd risk damaging. So I'm wondering if I should pull my troops at Surabaha back. I can't pull them all back. I can't pay, pull the artillery commandos or the base force. They're static. But I could potentially pull back the second KNIL Landstrom Battalion, which is 23 assault value. And I could pull back the headquarters of the MLD and the Commandant uh, Marine. Um, does the MLD have torpedo ordnance? In theory, I don't have any torpedo armed aircraft, I don't think. But, um, you know, I think we're going we're gonna to move these guys. It's going to take two days to get, one day to get this guy, two days to these. I'm going to pull these headquarters units, at least pull the headquarters units back. The second KNIL Landstrom Battalion, I think we could also pull back. Um, we'll still have 120 assault value with good coastal guns at at the base. So this way we'll get a, get a little bit of rest back here. So we'll start moving those men. I'm also going to pull the troops on the southern tip of Java back. It's a little bit premature. We don't know for sure that he's going to be landing there, but... I'm going to have a day to pack these guys up anyway, so they're not going to be moving till tomorrow. So I can always unpack them if it turns out the attack doesn't materialize. Uh, but if it does materialize, I think we're much better off uh, having already switched these guys into strat mode so they can hopefully rail out because he'll probably take Semaryang on the first landing turn. And then within two days, he'll probably take the next hex. Uh, if he And once he takes that second hex at uh, De Jacar De Jakarta, uh, he will cut off Java. He'll he'll cut it in two. So I think I need to get everybody in strat mode who is is on the other side of this this cutoff point and start pulling these other troops back uh, beyond it. We'll leave the base force at at this base here and um, and stick around here. Uh, that's weird, Sean Mac. Yeah, Spru I mean, maybe Sp Spruance wasn't the best at politics. He got himself in a bit of trouble from time to time because he was um, maybe militarily sound, but not always mindful of, of what his peers thought, perhaps, I guess. Uh, all right, so we're pulling elements of the Southeast Borno Battalion out. So there's still 10 more uh, infantry, actually 17 more infantry squads located to the north of Bandar Jasmine. We have pulled some of those troops out. However, we've got nine assault value. We've pulled eight squads, one vickers, 12 support out. So making a little bit of progress there. Uh, part of me wonders if maybe we shouldn't move those PBBYs up to Sabang so we can pull more of the uh, SSV battalion out, but I'm not sure. Stillwell was obviously very good at politics. He was, he was a piece of shit. Like, he, he was actively hurtful to the uh to the chinese war effort but you know he was good at politics i think that's probably true all right so we're pulling out troops through our catalinas we're pulling out the 224 raf group to rangoon where are they anyway i don't even see them here Is that unit pulling out something that doesn't exist there anymore? 224. Why don't I see any of the 224 here? 
Oh, they're there. Okay, so we've got about 1,100 of the 224 group out. There's a small amount of them left. 96, so a very small amount of this group is left at Sabang. So the almost the entire 224 uh, air group is into Rangoon, which is good news for us. It means we can probably also change up some of these air units here so that they're not all transporting. I think one group of Catalinas, maybe seven Catalinas here, is going to be enough to get what's left of the 224 group out. If not, it'll take two turns. But I think what we'll do is we'll start transporting other elements out. So maybe we'll start getting the Punjab Battalion out, I think. Let's see what the next unit is I want to pull out here. Um, SSV just started pulling in. Loyal Battalion here, British Infantry Section. I think those guys are still railing up from Meaden or still getting on, on rail cars. So these guys are one more day to pack up, and then they'll get what's left of this battalion out. So the the Punjab Battalion is fully in position here. It's 25 infantry squads are disabled and then nine active. Those would be a nice unit to throw on a base as like a garrison to prevent against enemy air attack. So I think what we'll do is we'll start transferring our other air groups. We'll leave the, two, the 102 detachment on the 224 group and we'll set the other guys to the Punjab Battalion to start getting them out. So we've got those two. All right, so we've got eight, 15 Catalinas working on it to get them out. And should be the rest of them. And then I also think we've got a couple of uh, air units over here maybe. No, they're pulling directly into Sabang. That's right. Okay. All right, so that's the situation there. We should probably check out the American uh, carriers or other things like that, right? So down in Perth, we've got more shipping arriving and unloading. Uh, Dutch subs just apparently replenished there. I'll send them on a mission off screen. We've got about 11,000 fuel on two different cargo task forces uh, that have just arrived. We're going to free up some dock space by dropping the troop transports that have already unloaded and just leaving the tanker docked up. So they still have about 20 or 4,600 to unload. And then we've got three cargo ships here that can now dock because we freed up the, the dock space here to unload uh, another 11,000 uh, or I guess 5,000 worth of fuel. So Perth is sitting at about quarter million fuel right now. Two task forces are there. We have some cruisers and destroyers coming back that badly need fuel, so they'll be sucking up some fuel in Perth. And then we've got another 20,000 coming on some more cargo ships here from Cape Town. Uh, if we go further west, another almost 10,000 coming from Cape Town. Uh, and then if we go even further west, we've got about 40,000 fuel coming on tankers from Cape Town. And then 57,000 supply, just a generic supply convoy coming into the Perth uh, from Cape Town as well. So we've got a, a string of cargo convoys that are all coming into Perth. Uh, we also have some supplies coming down from uh, from the island of Java. We'll switch these guys down to normal speed. We pulled out 11,000 fuel at the last second out of Oosthaven that came down from Palembang. So we did get a little bit more fuel out of the Dutch East Indies, which is also on the way there uh, and headed south as well. Uh, meanwhile, we've got some cargo, some tankers here moving north. These guys are all far, far enough west to be out of range of Palembang. Um, and then we are also bringing in some cruisers. Why are these guys completely out of fuel? Shit. That's a long way to go with no... No fuel there. All right, so... All right, let's do this. So we did get our uh, 7th Australian Division into port. So we got a lot of that. Uh, we got those troops into port, and now they're unloading. Um, so this, this task force here, can they dock? Can they fit? They're too large. Actually, most of them are already unloaded. There's still some elements of the 7th Division that haven't. So what we can do is we can move the unloaded ships into the port off the docks, and then we can... Uh, probably dock what's left of this task force, I would hope. Yep, 48,000 tons there. 
Uh, meanwhile, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to grab a couple of heavy cruisers out of Colombo. They've got a good amount of extra fuel, and we're going to have them head south to join that other task force um, so that they can hopefully get these guys replenished. So these guys should have a reasonable amount of fuel in them. We didn't use too much ops. We'll not allow retirement, and then we will send them south to meet up with these guys. I would do a meet task force order, but apparently if a, if a convoy is out of fuel, it will never get the meet task force. So we should send them here. It'll probably be two days before they arrive, but to try and minimize the system damage that these guys are going to take. Send them here. It'll probably be, like I said, two days before they arrive. These heavy cruisers should carry enough fuel in their bunkers to get those guys to port, with hopefully without taking too much more damage. The only ship I'm really worried about is the Sumatra, which has zero endurance left, which means it's already out of fuel. It can't it can't refuel from the other units because they're already too low on fuel, and it has 31 float damage and 42 system damage. And as you take damage from lack of fuel because you're at sea, basically drifting or being towed, um, the system damage will creep up, and the higher the system damage, the less able you are to deal with flooding damage. So there there is that as well. Yeah, I haven't really tried to pull out uh, Douglas MacArthur. He's still with USAFFE. Um, you know, in my world, the Australians have not asked for Douglas MacArthur to... Why is his inspiration level is pretty damn low at 34? I thought he was supposed to be super charismatic. His leadership level is 71, which is really good. But, but I haven't pulled him out because, uh, you know, because I don't want to spend 200 political points uh, on him. And, uh, you know, the Americans are probably going to leave him to die anyway in the Philippines uh, if the Australians hadn't specifically asked for him to come to Australia, right? I think that's the story anyway. So hopefully uh, that's what happens, and then we don't have to worry about him. Uh, so, no, it doesn't cost $200, Soviet exec uh, executioner. It's like 80 or 90 I think. It's not cheap, but it is very detailed. All right, so the forces in Port Moresby still, their assault value didn't really seem to drop. Their supplies on most of the heavy hitting units are still adequate to, for a defense, so that's good. Um, meanwhile, you can see here the runway damage is still getting better quickly. Runway damage is down to 29. Service damage and port damage are 80, 86 and 94. Those won't repair till the runway service damage is down to zero, I don't think, or the runway damage is down to zero. So uh, at least those will remain high for a while, especially if he keeps bombarding us. Meanwhile, you can see he did reinforce, you know, strengthen his positions uh, down here in the Solomon Sea. We have a bunch of subs, I think, that just arrived at Brisbane uh, for uh, replenishment. We do have a, a sub tender there so they can get new torpedoes and stuff like that there. Uh, meanwhile, the carriers finally have arrived at Hobart. Uh, they're chilling here. Um, I don't think we can actually, some of them can't dock. So we'll have to see what the what the right thing is to do with these guys. Um, but they are in port, and I have tankers on the way to get them more fuel. So I will see what I want to do with them. But I think they're safe from Japanese submarines on Tasmania, or the island, I think that, yeah, Tasmania. Um, because I think most of the Japanese subs we've seen have been in the Bass Strait. Hentai, thanks for the follow. Heaven Seed, thank you for the follow as well. Uh, Ramgar, thank you for the bits a while back. And Pete Z2629, thank you for the follow as well. Um, so we'll see what we do with the carriers off screen. Unloading some further supplies in New Zealand, that's good. Uh, 40,000 more fuel headed to Australia via these tankers, that's also good. Um, some additional amphibious craft are moving back to New Zealand to kind of get safe. Additional unloading of engineers on Raoul Island continues. The second Royal New Zealand Base Force. Raoul itself is working toward a level one airfield so that it can act as a ferry base for aircraft in Pago and Suva. Uh, Tonga Tapu, meanwhile, is working on its airfield that's up to 51%, so it can do the same. Vavu has already gotten its airfield to level 1. It is working on expanding that further. I'm going to start building more fortifications as well there, because uh, he could try and land back in this area. Who knows? He may try and land on some of these unoccupied bases to the south of Fiji. That is possible. He could try and turn them into airfields. Some of these bases are pretty good air potential airfields, like level 4s, uh, both at... Uh, Gao and Cavendu, but they'd be under constant air attack from our base at Suva, so he'd have to reduce that first. He certainly could with the carriers do that pretty damn quick, but, um, well, let's hope he doesn't do that because I don't have enough troops to put him everywhere. 
Um, okay. So that stuff's happening. Why is this guy just sitting there? President Polk, what are you doing? Why don't you go back to San Diego? Where was that uh, that ship that we lost? What was it? What was it full of? It was like just south of uh, of this area, right? So it wasn't either of these tanker task forces, which is good. These guys are bringing almost sixty thousand fuel to Australia, so um, glad that he didn't sink any of them. I think it was here. I think if this was, it, maybe it was, or maybe it was a, a task force that I already returned. I'm not really sure, but it was somewhere south of here. What does what does the uh, intel say? Ship sunk last turn. Admiral Williams, Type 95 torpedo, 26 two two six eighty near San Diego. Two two six eighty. So here. Maybe it was a ship that was coming up from uh, from Panama. In any event, that's good to know that he's got those that, those subs off the coast, because these guys are probably going to be headed that way next turn. Granted, it's just cargo ships and it's just supply, so I have to keep keep that in mind. We're also loading up almost 60,000 fuel on some tankers over here at Los Angeles, but we are going to have them pretty well escorted, multiple destroyers, gunboats, uh, uh, chase uh, vessels. Think Japan will make a gamble for Fiji? I have no idea. New torpedoes are as bad as the old ones. Little do I know, Doug has, a council, has council perms, so he can TP Australia. Maybe. Also, we detected an enemy submarine here moving east. Huh. That's interesting. Why are you just trying to get into our shipping lanes? I don't have a lot of uh, shipping in this area that I can do much with. I am sending a division up to Portland for what it's worth. Um, apparently, there's some like early game Japanese strategy where the Japanese can land at Portland and basically eliminate like 30 of your escort carrier production. A huge amount of, uh, of aircraft production as well if they take Portland uh, because it's a major production center. So I'm sending reinforcements there. They should arrive in two or three days. Um, yeah, I don't think he's looking for my carriers out that way. My carriers, we already kind of looked at that. They're way south. Yep, I know that YMS and YPs have ASW capability. Not as great in the open ocean, though. Um, okay, so I think that's probably it for the core part of this episode, guys. It was a little bit over an hour, but I don't think there's a lot else to talk about. There was one other thing, and maybe it's just a slight humble brag, but I do I do want to show you guys one other thing here, so just one second. Okay, guys, so what you're looking at now is a screen that was taken from a program called War, or called War in the uh, Pacific AE, or uh, WIP. TPAE, Warn the Pacific Admirals Edition Tracker. And this is a utility in Excel that gives you a whole bunch of detail around supply, production. It basically tracks everything that's going on and makes it much more accessible uh, than is typically the case in War in the Pacifics in the actual gameplay. You don't have to click 50 menus. You look through Excel. If you're familiar with Excel, it's really easy to, to take, take a look at things. And one thing I will call attention to is on the left side here, you can see the turns. So basically, you've got what turn uh, I was taking a snapshot on. I took three different snapshots. Um, this was uh, with some help from Evoken, so thanks to him. But um, you can see here, there are three different regions. So we're looking at all of our bases in China. This is just an aggregate. All of our bases in Burma and all of our bases in India. And the thing I want to call out here is that on turn 32, we had, I think this amounts to 60,000 supply in all of China. Maybe it may convert to something else, but the value that matters here is it's 60 or 59.022 supply in all of China, 23.309 fuel in China, and 226,753 resources in all of China. This is basically one month into the game. 
by turn 35, so two months into the game, that supply had dipped a bit, down to about 57,978 supply, 26,635 fuel, and 371,405 resources. The resources are going to go up pretty much no matter what in China, because China produces a lot of resources. That's one reason Japan really wants it. It can really help them buff up their economy. Uh, additionally, I believe fuel is produced at like Cyan and Luchao in the northern bases there, and it's produced a little bit more than the industry there will use. So you, you see a slight increase in fuel there. But you can see supply is trending down. Supply is always a problem in China for Japanese players. It is always a big challenge for a Japanese player to have enough supply. That's one of the biggest advantages that the Japanese have is that the Chinese simply don't have enough supply to operate offensively. They don't have enough supply, generally even, to keep their own troops in really good shape. Well, look at this. In the 40 or so turns, 37 turns, between turn 65 and turn 102, China's supply went from 57,978 to 123,221. That is a huge increase. We more than doubled our supply in all of China. Uh, we increased it by about, you know, 60, what, 66,000 uh, in the span of 37 days. And you might wonder, how the hell did that happen? Uh, I actually got a note from someone who was like, how did you do that? And I think the answer is Burma. If you look down here at Burma, we've been pumping supplies into Rangoon like none other, and the Japanese player has been fortunately uh, pretty accommodating to that. So you can see the supply situation in Burma on turn 32 was 31,741. Turn 65, it was 18,938. We really hadn't kicked up our shipment into Burma yet by that point. But in the last 37 days or so, we've actually dropped over 200, this doesn't capture all of that, but we've dropped well more than 200,000 supply into the port of Rangoon in the last month. So obviously, a bunch of that supply is still sticking around in Burma, you can see that. Um, but uh, 60,000 of that has made its way across the mountains, through the rail lines, through the, the, the uh, Burma road into China. Now, China gets about 2,000 supplies per turn as long as the Burma road is open, whether you put supplies into Rangoon or not. But we have obviously uh, supplemented that, that 2,000 supply per turn, or was it 200 supply per turn? Either way, we've supplemented that with a substantial amount of supplies that have made it from the Burma theater into the Chinese theater. We've also been doing about 100 aircraft a day in terms of uh, over the hump uh, transporting, using like bombers and whatnot to fly supplies directly from India to China. But that would not account for even close to 60,000 supply. So the additional supply is primarily coming from the port of Rangoon, and so our strategy there is working. It does make me a little bit uneasy because the Japanese player, if they end up taking, you know, Rangoon, they're, they're going to get a nice haul of supply there if, if it doesn't take a while for them to reduce the base. But in any event, I think getting more than double the supply situation in China is, uh, is probably worth it. And hopefully if Rangoon can, can stick around for another 15, 20 days, or however long it takes them to really ramp up the pressure in Burma, maybe we can get another 60,000 supplies into China and get China in even better shape. This is also really important because of some of those major battles fought in central China near Changsha, or even during those battles that were just fought at uh, Quilin. Those troops, for the most part, we did lose a fair number of destroyed squads, but most of those troops were not destroyed. They were dis disabled. Um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll be much will be in much better shape to get those disabled squads to active squads uh, with this supply because essentially the way you get you get disabled squads to heal again is they have to kind of sit in a base with with a good amount of supply uh, you kind of wash them with supply and they become good again um, hopefully we never lose Rangoon Neuhauser but it, you don't have to lose Rangoon he could just snip the line on the railway as well uh, one other thing worth calling out, the supply in India has gone up quite a lot. We've been pouring a lot of fuel into India as well, into um, uh, Karachi. So we've been dumping a lot of fuel there. So you can see the fuel in India has gone up from 259 to 528 to 659. We haven't brought that much. They produce some of their own fuel as well. They also produce their own resources. Uh, and that fuel and resources gets turned into supply. So you can see the supply amount going up. One other thing worth calling out also is that I don't have it on the screen here, but Australia's supply has more than doubled as well. Uh, I think most of that was because we poured like 300,000 oil from the Dutch East Indies into Australia. And Australian industry will produce more supply than you can can ever use but it is very hard to get that to work that way because you have to put a ton of fuel 
I think it's like two fuel equals one supply. So you have to put a ton of fuel into Australia to get the industry to really uh, churn out enough enough supply to, to support your operations. But And the Allies don't typically have enough tankers, but because we were able in the early war period to pull a lot more fuel out of the Dutch East Indies than, than you typically are able to do uh, against a human player, um, that caused our, our fuel and supply in Australia to double it in the first 60 days of the game. Since then, we haven't, we've been kind of cut off from the Dutch East Indies and it's actually started to slide a little bit or stagnate a little bit. Um, so we need to do a better job of putting more fuel and supply into Australia. Um, but it hasn't slipped much. So those additional convoys that are coming in in the next few days may equalize things a little bit. Um, the supply situation hasn't, hasn't, hasn't degraded at all. Just the fuel situation, but the fuel drives the industry. So, um, in any event, that's sort of a, a logistical update on uh, our War in the Pacific game. And I think that's all I got for you guys. So we're going for about an hour, 10 minutes. We'll probably cut it off here. Probably do some more uh, Grand Tactician tomorrow or maybe some combat mission. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. Thanks for coming out once again. Uh, thank you for the new followers. Hentai, Heaven Seed, Petz, Pet Z2629. Uh, General Rubinsky, you followed two hours ago. I don't know if you're around. Uh, and then Laika Gman and Ramgar, thank you very much for the bits and all of the subs. Thank you for uh, continuing with, uh, with supporting the channel there as well. Uh, until next time, guys, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out. <laughs>